and who else? Oh, uh, oh, we are live. We, we are, are live. live. We are recording. Charlie missed the cue. It's okay. There we was just roll with it. You missed the cue. It's a look back in time. 1996 Survivor Series of that year. We were both in attendance. What a time to be alive. What a time in my life. I will leave out what was going on in my life at that time. But crap was going down. Um, JML here. Charlie, Charlie over, over there. there. Say hello, Charlie. Hello, Charlie. <laughs> uh, I brought out the Bret Hart jacket just like I did for the SummerSlam 1992 show. Why? Why did I bring out this Bret Hart jacket? Because he was in one of his best matches ever on this card. Well, this was also the return of Bret Hart after a very, very long layoff. So and much so that Charlie admitted the product between him being Bret, him being Bret, not being on the active roster, hurt the subsequent shows. Just keep making me give credit to Bret Hart. Just you know. <laughs> this when I first met Charlie, when I first met him, he was a staunch Bret Hart hater. Did not like him. Was a HBK I guy. A hater. You were okay. You I still were. met him. You were. Um. This event took place at the Mecca, Madison, Madison Square, blah, Madison, Madison Square Garden. <laughs> Let's try that again. Where did it take it was place? A sold out crowd. Charlie was in attendance. I was in attendance. My first event ever live. His first event, not my first event, not my first. Oh no! Radio. No! Wait! 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 My first pay per view live because I went to the Heart Heart Attack tour. At uh, Continental Airlines Arena. Oh. Hmm. I wonder why it was called the Heart Attack Tour. Not uh, the Heartbreak Kid Tour. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Interesting. And I like Shawn Michaels. We know this. It's just I'm more of a Brett guy. And I'm vice versa. <laughs> Another... Stand out to this whole entire show was the debut of Rocky Maivia. Who's Rocky Maivia? Who's Rocky Maivia? Rocky Maivia was the precursor to The Rock, Dwayne Johnson. He made his debut here. We'll get into that. Uh, we'll get into uh, how this show, in my opinion, and I'm sure Charlie will echo my thoughts as well, or he might disagree with me. Who knows? This was the dawning of a whole new era of WWF at the time. This was, real to me, this really got the gears in motion towards what we would call the Attitude Era. This just, like, started it. Not saying this was the, you know, I think when we get to WrestleMania 13, I think that's the starting point. Yeah. But yeah. the wheels were getting set in motion with Brett's return and then the storyline that unfolds after that. Um, the main event, Psycho Sid, Shawn Michaels, originally the main event, was supposed to be a rematch between Vader and Shawn Michaels. They previously had a match at SummerSlam, which we reviewed. That was the last one we did. That's in the archives. Check it out. It was a tremendous show. Tremendous show. We miss you, Fire Frank. Um, let's get right into uh, the matches. Indeed. Do you want to proceed? Indeed. So... The first match was a lot better than I remembered. It was 
Owen Hart and Bulldog with the new Rockers versus Furnace, Lafon and the Godwins. Now, the people at home are probably going, who the hell were Furnace and Lafon? I'll, I'll tell you something. They were a very underrated tag team. You think? They just had zero charisma. Yeah. They could. They worked really, really. You know what they reminded me of? What? A really good AEW tag team. Being. Well, AEW a lot of their tag teams they just they, oh, they, just they, lack, they lack characterization. Oh, okay. They lack charisma. That that's yeah. Like they, like Lafon and Furnace, they would be great probably in this era. Of wrestling overall, where like that style, that shoot style, people like it. I like it somewhat. Think sometimes a little overblown, but I think the Godwins. I might get laughed at here. They were very underrated as well. They, they weren't were a bad tag team. They just were saddled with a terrible gimmick. Horrible gimmick. And Hillbilly Jim didn't help much either. No, it did not. Um, I think the Godwins actually they hit their stride when they turned heel. Unfortunately, if you look back, the heel Godwins would not fly in today's society no. for a multitude of reasons. I think there was a little Confederate flag that they would wear to the yeah to the ring. Um, overall, like the eight men in the ring can go you had the new rockers who were janetti and, and al snow oh. no slouches and bulldog when he was in a tag team he could always hold his own at this time yeah, he didn't have to wrestle constantly and he could tag out when he was feeling bloated yep this was like the perfect and, and then you know we don't have to say anything else about owen no but uh i, I thought this was a really good opener um, was it the best opening match we've ever seen? No, but it was a solid opener for this card. A lot better opener than we got in 1996. Another, another, another event where they're like, "Who do we have to open the show?" Owen Hart. <laughs> Owen Hart. And what I liked was at least they made Furnace and Lafon look good. They set up a storyline for the feud that happened between Bulldog, Hart, and Lafon and Furnace. So I really liked the whole execution of the storyline. Uh, then we go to a backstage segment. How good was 1996 Mankind? Again. I can't praise his 1996 work enough and his character of Mankind enough. He was creepy. He hit high and low notes, screaming, and just pulling his hair out, completely living the character. When he told Paul Bearer not to worry, man, was that creepy. Yeah. Um, how cool was this Undertaker entrance? I remember being there live for it. It was, it was quite a scene. The ring gear, first of all, that yeah. the Undertaker wore was amazing. I could see why he didn't wrestle in it too many times after because it was all leather. Yeah. But man, that get up was awesome. Um The unfortunate thing is it was a good match, definitely not their best match. No, I, I feel it was too short. How long did this match go? Uh, they had, they had fifteen. More. They had fifteen minutes. Maybe I just wanted more. It, it just wasn't great. It seemed like both guys were probably not happy with the finish they were given. Yeah. Um. It, it, and I didn't like that they, they went through this whole scenario with the the cage. Then you had 
the executioner. Awful. Do you do you remember who the executioner was? I was thinking this throughout watching it. I I know he was someone, but I couldn't put my finger on it. Who was he? Think of a famous edge shooting on a wrestler. It's like when the rated R superstar really hit his stride, he mentioned how this person died. Oh! Wrestling trivia. You you guys at home. I know it. I And and what about your pal? Oh, wait, wait that's right. He's dead. Uh, Terry. Bam Terry, Bam Gordy. Terry Gordy. Yeah. Terry Gordy. Okay. Yeah. So who they had to put under a mask because they didn't want people to know it was him because yeah. he was way past his expiration date for numerous of reasons. And, you know, he battled his demons as well. And unfortunately, he just... This didn't work. This didn't work out. Uh, we won't cover the next in your house pay-per-view but him and undertaker have quite possibly the worst one of the worst matches i've ever seen they had in your house match? yeah exactly <laughs> i don't remember them having pay-per-view match yeah it was the uh the december in your house where Maybe i don't remember them putting that much trust in the executioner but they didn't either he got like uh, it was it was it was awful it was okay. so bad um, and it looked clunky too. Like it looked like Barrow was supposed to get touched, but he didn't get touched. Then he just leaves the ring and walks down the aisle. The Undertaker looked confused. It looked like someone missed the cue. Gotcha. So for that, this is definitely the worst of the Taker Mankind matches by a country mile. It was set up for this grand. Arrival of <laughs> the executioner, and uh, it, it fell flat. You go from one of the best entrances ever, in my opinion, that Taker mm-hmm. had. There's been a lot of them. We talked about uh, what was that 92 SummerSlam? That one was awesome. This one is, is right up there. Um, Any other thoughts, Charlie? You were, just, you were just in the middle of a segue. What? You were like, we go from one of the best entrances to... No. Any other <laughs> thoughts? Any other thoughts? No. Cool. This kind of set the stage for uh, The Undertaker slowly morphing into All right, the Ministry Taker. Yeah. The teardrop. Yeah. All right, so what's the next match, Charlie, without looking? Oh, jeez. It's a Survivor Series elimination match. Oh, uh, Rocky and his team versus uh, Goldust and his team. (laughs) (laughs) Which I went so into detail on which teams were involved there. but So it's Triple H... Crush, Jerry Lawler, and Goldust versus Mark Marrow, Rocky Maivia, Jake Roberts, and The Stock. Want me to tell you something? Go for it. Why why did they make such a big deal of Jake Roberts coming out for this pay-per-view? I have no idea. (laughs) I couldn't tell you. They made more of a big deal for Jake Roberts than the freaking Rock. Yeah. Thank God The Rock got rid of this Maki, Rocky Maivia gimmick. It was pretty yeah, horrific. Blue chipper. He's the blue chipper. First, third generation superstar, Rocky Maivia. How many times did Vince say Rocky Maivia? Enough. Uh, you could tell, though, there was something there. Just not the right gimmick. Yeah. Um... This was Barry Windham about 
four years past his prime. This was Jake Roberts, three years past his prime. Jerry Lawler shouldn't have been featured in any WWE rings. Yet he still was for a while after this event, too. Yeah. Yeah, because I've been watching. I've been skipping ahead. Yeah. And he has a match in, in 1997, King of the Ring, with uh, Mankind. And I'm like, why, why did this happen? <laughs> Um, and one thing that I don't like Bret Hart for was he saddled Jerry the King Lawler with the worst chant against a wrestler ever. Burger King. Burger King. It made me not like Burger King as a kid. <laughs> I was like, I guess Bret Hart has something against Burger King, so I don't like Burger King either. Wow. Yep. Uh, what did you think of this match? It was a standout performance for uh, Rocky Maivia. Other than uh, that, it sucked. Yeah. <laughs> it was not good. My whole lead up with past their prime, people it should does, have been in the ring. Does still showcased a little bit. Yeah. I mean, Triple H, Goldust. And the rock, other than that, it was uh, just over the hill, the over the hill gang. Screen just went off for a bit. We got some vignettes, some video packages of the Brett Stone Cold match. They were building. Now, because the next match is Brett and Austin. For me, as a fan, and we were, what, 10 around this time? Both of us? Yeah. We were 10-year-olds. Even though Stone Cold had won the King of the Ring... It didn't seem like they were doing anything with him until just from out of nowhere, Bret Hart challenged him to a match. Which was so out of left field. But according to rumor, reports, actually out of Bret's mouth, he wanted to work with Austin. He wanted to give Austin the opportunity. And boy, did he take advantage of that opportunity, Stone Cold Steve Austin. Absolutely. Now, I think a lot of people are familiar with the Fez Press throwing punches Stone Cold Steve Austin. This was right before that period. He was still a technical wrestler. He lost the ability to do that once he had the neck injury. At this point, Steve Austin might have been the second best technical wrestler or third in wrestling. wrestling Against the number one technical wrestler. This was... In my opinion, it was an amazing buildup. It made Austin look like a star, even in defeat. You still got the heroes, welcome back. Hey, you, you get the victory. Looked like he had no ring rust whatsoever. Uh, this was, a, a, in my opinion, the start of a star-making performance yeah. that crescendos and builds to Wrestlemania 13 where they raise the bar even more it's just unfortunate that we didn't get that many more confrontations between the two of them because they were really magic together in the ring in promos just in every segment those two just brought out the best in each other 
And I think when you when you talk about Austin and, and Brett individually, people don't bring up the actual rivalry they had, and they only bring up the WrestleMania 13 match. But their rivalry, in my opinion, was one of the best rivalries in the history of wrestling for not only what it, it did for the both of them, but what it what what it did for wrestling in that moment and for years to come. Yeah. Charlie. Definitely fair to say. Uh, your thoughts on this match, everything that I said. I believe that they should have had more contests, but uh, in two episodes from now, we'll be going over WrestleMania 13. And in that match, they took it to the absolute limit. So I'm glad the two matches that they did have were barn burners. Yep. Um, yeah. Uh, Austin was fully technical in this match. He brought out the, he busted out the clover leaf, million dollar dream, what have you. Uh, this was definitely the match of the night in my eyes. Yep. Stole the show. And it was the same finish that Hart did with Piper. Yes. yes. Which was a nice callback. Very nice callback. Um, it's just... And I say it again, you know, I'm, I'm a big shield for for Brett. However, there's a reason why I am. We've done this show now and reviewed 93 through 96. Has this guy hasn't had one terrible or even mediocre pay-per-view match? He delivers. He delivers every single time. It's just unprecedented. We talk about Michaels. Michaels and Vader. That was a big dud. Not Michaels' fault. Not Michaels' fault. But let's see. Maybe if they got Brett in there, maybe it would have been different. Yeah. Right? Maybe. Perhaps. Maybe it still would have been shit. But... If you look at track record, it, probably not. Um, just <laughs> the winner obviously got the shot at either Sid or Michaels at the next pay per view. That was the stipulation for the Austin Hart match. Speaking of interviews, Psycho Sid and a live mic. <laughs> Match made in hell. Oh my god. Do you why can't they just do pre-tapes for him? I have no idea. It just did it didn't make sense. You want to talk about you want to talk about a absolute stink fest our next survivor series elimination match might be one of the worst of all time it might be and we've seen four well three miniature jerry the king wallers and jerry the king waller in a match against a doink and three dinks but this might take the cake it is the hodgepodge of I can't believe I'm going to roll these lists as one elimination match at a Survivor Series. Farouk. Okay, that seems pretty good. <laughs> Vader. Not good at this point. Probably not. Unhappy that he's probably supposed to be he was supposed, well, not probably. He was supposed to be in the main yeah. event of this show. And then and then the greatest, the greatest gimmicks of all time, the fake Razor Ramon and Diesel. <laughs> oh, versus, versus all of the racial stereotypes, okay? This is what these four individuals were. I'm just calling it like I see it. 
Savio Vega, Flash Funk, Jimmy Snuka, who probably killed someone, and Yokozuna. Why was why on earth was Snuka called into this match? Because 13 years prior, he jumped off a cage yeah. at Madison Square Garden. Okay. And I guess he's probably related to Yoko, and this was a favor to Yoko? I don't know. <sighs> this had to be one of Yoko's last pay-per-view matches. Yeah. I mean... Talk about gassed. Oof. He had to be, and I'm not making fun, he had to be like 800 pounds here. That's a bit of a stretch, but... Charlie, I'm going to pull up the picture. Hold on. He was... That guy doesn't look 800 pounds? <laughs> Let's meet at six. Six? He was six two years prior. Oh. All right. That Maybe. man was eating turkey legs. Hold the big ones. With mayo, dipped in mayo, jars of mayo. He was eating a sushi roll for each one of his sushi rolls. My, I feel bad. Like, he should still be here. Like, ah, man. And you would think Jim Cornette on commentary would have been entertaining and made this match worse. Oh, yeah. Who was the fake Diesel, by the way? Oh, the fake... I wonder. Kane? <laughs> yep. yep. And the fake the... Razor doesn't matter because he just sucked at his job. Uh, was fake Razor ever anybody else? Rick Bogner. That was his was, name. Was Don't he ever anybody him. else? He ended up being a member of NWO Japan. Oh, wow. Yep. So, Rick Bogner, I apologize for Charlie for calling you a nothing. Oops. You're one of the 137 NWO members that were out there. Yes. Yeah, so um, terrible match. Again, as a kid, I was probably really excited. I probably thought that was a good match, but I had to watch it. It's It was horrible. And... Now I have glaucoma due to the, watching that match. Uh, main event time. Yes. Shawn Michaels <coughs> with Jose Lothario. I, I freaking hate Jose Lothario. You haven't made that clear enough yet. Who is this? Why is he with <laughs> Shawn Michaels? As we've People said in the before. back. As we've said before, he should have just stuck to Shawn Michaels' training clips for uh, WrestleMania 12. But oh my god, here we are, and his son's involved now. Uh, it, listen, this uh, Jose Lothario was like 63 years old. He looked 103 years yeah. old. He couldn't. It wasn't like he was talking for Michaels. No. I could see if Sherry Martell came back as uh, Michaels' manager and was flashing her rear end, that would have made sense. But sixty-three-year-old Jose Lothario, who none of us ever ever saw in WWF, no, was in the main events here. How much stroke did Shawn Michaels have? It's, it's incredible. Um, Psycho Sid. Very over. Very over. Hugely over. Especially with Madison Square Garden crowd. This was the 90s Madison Square Garden, so they cheered for every heel there was. Well, so. Watching all of the pay-per-views up to King of the Ring 97, yeah. Sid was just getting huge pops. Every pay-per-view. Crazy. Yeah. Um, 
this was a really good match. This is probably the best match that Sid, Sid has ever went had. The yeah, Sid went the distance in this one. Uh, Michaels made him look like a million bucks. Yep. Michaels turned into a tree for him. <laughs> he turned into a tree. Um, it, I love that we got two great matches. Yeah. So, but, <laughs> understand only in WWE can you have a pay per view that gimmicks around eight man tag matches and the two singles matches are what steal the show. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Uh, it is, it, it was, and this was like one of the first times where the baby face champion got booed out of a building oh yeah i mean i had to boo i had to boo Shawn michaels that night you were because if i would have cheered him i probably would have got shanked by some new york city thug okay (laughs) i was still cheering for him i was like i don't get this why is he being booed but and if and i read on the news well i read on the news i read in the newspaper that a 10-year-old got stabbed after... Was that you? Was that you, Charlie? No. For cheering? No. Okay. Well, congratulations to Psycho Sid becoming WWF champion for the first time. Um, this was... Like I said, this was a great match. Uh, the powerbomb was over. People Definitely. popped for the powerbomb. Definitely. The camera spot, I loved. It was everything you would have wanted out of a, uh, and more out of a Psycho Sid match. Kudos to HBK. It showed his greatness. Just like Brett, just like a Macho Man, just like a Kurt Angle. Would you have the ability to work with different competitors of all shapes and sizes and put on high quality matches shows how great you are in the ring. Yeah. And the people that I mentioned all do that. Uh, Danielson, same thing. Jericho, like those guys know how to work and use people's size and use, use them to their strengths and not to their weaknesses. So Michael's definitely worked that with Sid in this. Yeah. So obviously, um, we'll review Royal Rumble at a later date. Spoiler, we're actually recording that episode tomorrow. But (laughs) you guys will see it at a later date than than tomorrow. Um, Overall, this show, what did you think? Uh, like we said earlier, it was basically just the two singles matches that really took off this event. Uh, I'd rated a mediocre Survivor Series. I'm going to go above not average. Match, not the worst. I'm going to go above average. Uh, the opening match was good. These two solo matches were good. Uh, you got a debut of The Rock, uh, which... For me, when you're retrospectively retro, doing a retro review of a show gives it brownie points. Um, I thought it was just a great event. So maybe because we were there too. I don't know. I just, I look at this, I can't, for me, I can't call it mediocre. It's got to be on the above average scale to maybe even great would we go and look at other survivor series we'll see how this one stacks up but right now i'll say it's above average what do you want to say to our audience charlie as always like share subscribe comment uh the i see the poll is doing well for which wcw event we should uh cover 
which is going to be great for me because, as JML said before, it's going to be my first time watching WCW events. And yes. Them. So that'll be an interesting take on things. Take uh, on me. Just keep tuning in because we got a whole lot more for you. So right now, as we're recording on a Tuesday, August 23rd, uh, NWO sold out 1997 is in first place. Um, I will end this poll. I was just about to ask. Probably in a couple days. Okay. I will give it till Friday, actually. And then we'll close it. And whatever has the lead, obviously we're going to do. But we'll take the other ones into consideration as well. Maybe we'll do another poll. We'll, we'll see. I was going to say, maybe this should be how we do it from now on for WCW events. Because the asking for comments <laughs> wasn't really working out in our favor. Yeah, I think if we do the, the poll, for me... Like, if, if I was like Charlie and I didn't watch WCW, at least I could go, NWO sold out. I could look at the card and go, oh, Hogan was on this card and Brett was on this card against, uh, no, that's uh, 98. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh -oh. Sold out 98 was, was actually a banger. It was uh, Flair and Brett wrestled on that card. It was nice. great. NW sold out might be the worst of the bunch. It's okay. We'll do it. You guys pull it. We'll do it. Um, my personal favorite, not trying to sway votes here, would be Spring Stampede 1994. Really? I thought you would have said Bash at the Beach. That was the NWO one, right? No. So Spring Stampede 1994 had a gem, a gem of a match. It was headlined. By Ric Flair and Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. Oh. And one of the matches that no one talks about. It was just unbelievable. Nice. Um, so I'm kind of pulling for that one. But I'll be happy to do any of them. Charlie has zero clue about any of them. Right? You, you don't know. Besides Bash know at the Bash, Beach. Bash at the Beach was NWO, right? Yes, which countless okay. of, of podcasts and, and shows have done. Yeah. So maybe people don't want to see that again, but who knows? If you want to see it, vote it. If you don't, don't vote it. Uh, we I'm are going to watch whatever. So we're over 500 subs. Thank you so much. I think we're at 531. Ooh. Which is awesome. I'm towards six really fast. Yep. Uh, on the way to 1K is what I'm calling it. So when we get there, uh, expect even more variety to what we do. We love you. Thank you so much. Like, share, comment, subscribe. That helps other people find us on YouTube that are searching for wrestling content, sports content, card breaking content. All of that. Again, we love you. Good night and good luck. We'll see you in the breaks. Farewell.